Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those of you who are joining us from around the world for the uh, webinar on Shaping the Future of Health Markets, Reflections from Bellagio. My name is Jeff Knezovic. I'm the Policy Influence and Research Uptake Manager for the Future Health Systems Consortium. And I'm introducing the Bellagio, uh, the, the Bellagio webinar, as we're calling it today. Um, and we'll then be handing it over to our chair, Sarah Bennett, for an introduction uh, of the Bellagio statement and where we've, uh, the journey that we've gone on to get here. Uh, one thing to say before we get started is that we do have a hashtag for the Twitter users amongst you, uh, which is hashtag healthmkt. You can use Twitter to either live tweet uh, anything you find interesting from the event, or also to ask questions, although you're also able to ask questions through the question box uh, on the side. Just a very quick introduction. This symposium is being held, or this webinar is being held in the run-up to the Private Sector and Health Symposium, which is taking place in Sydney this July. Uh, this symposium uh, has happened once every two years since 2009, uh, before the International Health Economics Association Conference. The aim is to encourage and disseminate high-quality research on the performance of these markets and on practical strategies for improving access to safe and effective services by the poor. This time, the Future Health Systems Consortium is responsible for organizing uh, this symposium, though it's been passed to other uh, organizations uh, share that responsibility. The idea behind this webinar series was to provide an opportunity to set the scene before Sydney itself to ensure that those who are not attending the symposium have the opportunity to participate in debates about strategies for improving performance of health markets in meeting the needs of the poor. So uh, we really welcome your participation here uh, and the idea is that as we continue this webinar series we will really build on these core themes that are part of the symposium and be able to hit the ground running once we arrive in Sydney. Um, the first webinar was held uh, by CHMI. This one is now being organized under the auspices of the Future Health Systems Consortium, but the next one will uh, take place in April and will be organized by the SHOPS program, so do be on the lookout for uh, the next webinar invitation if you enjoy yourself today. In terms of this webinar, uh, we will start with an introduction uh, about the Bellagio Statement and, and uh, the process that we uh, took to arrive at that by Sarah Bennett, who's the CEO of Future Health Systems and Associate Professor at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Following that, we will have commentary from Dr. Alan Pamba, from uh, Dr. Kwesi Bohane, uh, Kelechi Ohiri, and Guy Stallworthy. Um, of those organizations represented there uh, above. Unfortunately, um, Zakir, uh, Dr. Zakir, who was originally slated to be on this panel, uh, was not able to join us today due to the continuing unrest in Bangladesh. He apologizes sincerely for missing this particular webinar, but I suppose these are the perils of having webinars in a globalized world. Um, you never know what's going to happen. So um, apologies for that. Uh, that will be followed by a fishbowl discussion uh, where various panelists will um, reflect on what they've heard. Uh, we will also open the microphones up of a few other people who have, were actually present at Bellagio for them to input. And there will then be a, a final opportunity for a question and answer session uh, and for participants, the attendees, to actually submit those um, sessions. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Bennett for um, a, an introduction to the Bellagio statement. So please hold on one second as we pass over the, um, pass this over. <laughs> 
Sorry, uh, everybody. I just wanted to quickly say apologize for the slides not advancing. That was due to a technical difficulty. Um, you didn't miss much. I know that you heard the audio from me, so that should be fine. And I will now pass it over to Sarah Bennett with the actual slide deck. Apologies. So the webinar today draws upon a meeting that was held in Bellagio towards the end of last year. And really we gathered a group of different people who wanted to reflect and think about the future of health markets, how they were evolving, and what the challenges were going to be over the next 20 to 30 years. So I wanted to start out by just giving you a little framing for why we were interested in health markets and the kind of angle that we were coming from. The position of most of the members of the group gathered is that health markets are pervasive that throughout low and middle income countries, health markets are critical in providing a range of different types of services and of health related goods. For example, food, food supplements, pharmaceutical products, diagnostic services are all provided by the market in many different contexts. And markets occur at subnational level, national and global. And in our view, such markets encompass both public and private sector actors. So we weren't thinking just about private sector actors alone, but really how do different public and private sector actors come together and, tran and make transactions. I don't think that any of us would say that health markets were the only way to understand what goes on in terms of health, but we did feel that understanding how health markets work is really critical to be able to figure out how to intervene in them better. And we were particularly concerned about poor people and their access to health services through health markets. We know that many poor people in the world access health services through the market and we want to know how we can intervene in order to enable them to have access to better quality health services. We felt as a group that there had been hugely important changes that had occurred during the past 20 years in terms of our understanding of health markets. So, for example, we've learned a lot about the heterogeneity of private providers, the fact that we have to understand the differences between different types of private healthcare providers in order to be able to characterize the market. The fact that many important players in health market are there in a kind of informal capacity. They may be um, partially trained healthcare providers who are not fully qualified. They may be fully qualified public sector healthcare providers who moonlight or work informally in health markets. We also feel that we've learned a lot about more formal mechanisms for the government to engage with private sector actors. So for example, there's been a lot of work around contracting for services and social marketing. But there's still a sense that there are gaps in our knowledge. In particular, we feel that we know very little about how to scale up effective market interventions and how to improve the quality of services provided in health markets, particularly for the poor. Finally, our sense is that there's only going to be increasing importance of health markets. And we've noticed that growth in health markets during the past 20 years as well, due to economic growth, due to new communications technology, mobile phones. We feel that there has already been growth in health markets, and that trend is likely to continue. And finally, in the past 20 years, we've seen really important trend of economic liberalization across many uh, states in uh, low and middle income countries. And um, that has been another factor that has helped promote the growth of health markets. So if we have to look to the future, what do we think we might see? First, we don't think that health markets are going to stay static at any point in time. There is a continuing evolution. And we've already touched upon some of those things that are driving that evolution. But they include, for example, increased use of technology within health markets, so the growing appreciation and understanding of the role for, for consumer education, and how we can educate and provide information to consumers who may then become more active consumers of healthcare. And also, the growth of non-communicable diseases may have a very important uh, implications for health markets. For example, for people with long-term care really becoming their own best advocates and perhaps 
um, engaging more actively in terms of uh, determining what kind of treatment and what kind of diagnostic and, and, and checks and support that they need within health markets. We sense that there may be increasingly strong market players. And there seems to be a trend at the moment towards some degree of consolidation and vertical integration in health markets, which may lead to a smaller number of players in health markets. And that could have both advantages and disadvantages. One obviously really big important trend at the moment in, in the health systems arena as a whole is around universal health coverage. And we can see that that could have huge implications um, for health markets. In particular, it may open the doors to um, a growth in public finance for private providers. And we think that there's all sorts of questions there about how best to ensure that that public funding is well used. The growth that we've seen in the past 20 years and perhaps ongoing growth in the future. We think that there's probably likely to be growing pressure on governments to oversee health markets and perhaps be stronger stewards of those markets. So that was kind of the context in which um, Bellagio took place. Um, and there was a lead up to the Bellagio meeting. And I just wanted to describe that to you very briefly. Um, so sort of around this time last year, a group of us undertook a landscaping analysis that involved document review and interviews with a range of different stakeholders to try and understand what they saw to be the long-term trends in health markets and also the emerging issues in health markets. And we identified a handful of topics that we thought it would be really interesting to um, focus the Bellagio meeting on. And they included um, firstly, regulation of health markets. Secondly, um, emerging trends in terms of networking of providers. And then third and finally, we focused upon learning in health markets. There's a lot of challenges, we think, to learning, both in terms of the silos across different actors and in terms of the kind of data and evidence we have available to us. So we wanted to understand what could be done to promote better learning in health markets. We prepared a series of background papers across those three topics, and those were presented at the meeting in Bellagio. And I guess although we had um, those three topics and the background papers related to them as our starting point for Bellagio, as you will see, the discussions were more broad-ranging, and what actually ended up being incorporated into the Bellagio statement covered some of the topics that were originally put on the table, plus some other new directions. So I'm going to move on next to talk about the Bellagio statement. And, and this, this snapshot is taken on the final day of our Bellagio meeting. And you can see it looking out over Lake Como. And we had snow that day, which was just a wonderful. It's a really magical place for, for a meeting, and particularly when the snow comes down. So the Bellagio statement was crafted around a number of different themes and issues that the participants at Bellagio thought that it was really important that the community of actors who are interested in health markets pay attention to moving forward. And the first of this is around strengthening data. We thought that lack of data on health markets continues to plague decision making at every level. We think there's a need to identify key data that health market actors should provide. And we were suggesting that there may be certain carrots and sticks that could be used to encourage health market actors to provide this kind of information. So for example, in order to be able to participate in any kind of government financing schemes, we think that there's probably a minimum data set that these health market actors should be required to provide. We also began to think about the fact that data around health markets is likely to come from a diversity of different sources. For example, you might think about demographic and health surveys, DHS. You might think about national health accounts. Frequently, there are private firms that do market research, and they often have quite a lot of information relevant to health markets. So we, won we felt that there was a need to think through how you could pull these different sources of data together and combine them. So we wanted to pilot that kind of uh, data platform that would draw upon multiple different sources. Secondly, we really wanted to see greater experimentation with regulatory approaches. Uh, regulation has been one of those topics that has been on the sort of policy agenda for health markets for years, and we were really frustrated with uh, the lack of progress in, in that sense. We felt that effective regulation typically re requires 
bundles of regulatory approaches. It can't just be one strategy alone. Again, we need to have both carrots and sticks in order to get uh, satisfactory regulatory approaches. And further, regulatory approaches need to be dynamic. We recognize that market actors will figure out what's going on in terms of regulation and will adapt their behaviors accordingly. And so regulation really requires a learning and doing type of approach and the capacity on the side of government and the regulators to be able to figure out how to adapt strategies so that they continue to be effective over time. So we argued that it would be great to have some kind of experimentation with regulation and then real-time yet rigorous assessment of the effects of that regulation and then adaptation of strategies and an ongoing lesson learning so that we could continue to reflect what works, what doesn't work and how it needs to be adapted over time. So this brings me to the third point which was around government stewardship capacity. There was a sense that governments frequently lack appropriate capacity to be able to manage health markets and to particularly in order to be able to draw together this kind of data about what's going on in health markets and adapt their strategies accordingly. And we felt that there was a need to develop individual skills and organizational capacity so that government could be and better stewards of markets. And this would mean developing leadership skills within government so that they were better positioned to be able to balance powerful interests, developing technical capacity so that they could develop market information systems so that they were better equipped to contract out particular services, and developing their collaborative capacity. And we felt that often there was some sort of distrust on the part of government and that there was really a need to be able to work more effectively with civil society, with private providers, with business interests. This final point about analytical skills and the ability to track what's going on and to anticipate future developments in health markets is something that I've already touched upon. The fourth theme was around sustaining investments and I've referred earlier to the fact that we think that there has been almost an explosion of um, investments in uh, new approaches to working with markets. And donor funding has supported quite a lot of that experimentation. So, for example, we've seen donor support to private sector experimentation with social franchises, with contracting out, uh, with social marketing of um, health-related goods. Frequently, these kind of initiatives are on a small scale, but some provide critical services to the poor. Given the current economic climate, there was a concern about how some of these initiatives might be sustained going forward. And the leaders of many of these initiatives were very actively looking for strong sustainability strategies, which obviously meant optimizing their own business model, but also looking at ways of bringing in government financing. In particular, that government financing was thought to be key to enabling access for the poor. So we sense that there is a considerable challenge around the future sustainability of some of these investments. And obviously, it may not be the case that all of these investments in um, sort of market experiments uh, need to be maintained. But some of them are proven, appear to be delivering quality services for the poor. And there needs to be proactive engagement with government so we can figure out the future sustainability of these kind of services. One theme which, to be honest, we didn't spend a lot of time um, talking about, but we did feel was really important and often under-recognized was the links between health markets and health worker policies. And we all know that there's been a big focus recently on human resources for health, the gaps in the health workforce, um, and yet the connections between health workers and health markets are often insufficiently acknowledged. But just to give um, a couple of examples, we are aware that in many countries um, there is moonlighting by government health professionals and the extent to which they are engaged in health markets often depends in part on the remuneration packages they have in government but also on the opportunities that are available in the health market. So recognizing how health workers go backwards and forwards between public and private sectors and thinking about policies that best accommodate this whilst ensuring quality services that are available and accessible, particularly to poor populations, is important.
Um, health worker migration is another angle on this. And uh, we think in particular, given growth in medical tourism, that's something that we need to think about. Finally, uh, in many, and um, particularly low-income countries, there is a lot of effort at the moment on developing community health workers. And it seems that there's not always the same effort that's going into thinking about um, the long-term sustainability of their salaries and how government can support them over the longer term. And that really does create concerns about what might happen to those health workers in the future and to what extent they may end up working in the private market or in health markets to support themselves. I mentioned that one of our theme was around health networks. Our sense is that business models are evolving quite rapidly and that we're seeing greater networking and increasing integration of previously disorganized private providers. Obviously, we haven't done the empirical work to really figure out whether this is the case, but anecdotally, it seems to be true. Our sense is that networks can be hugely important to help correct the failures which are typical of health markets. So, for example, in terms of informational asymmetries, by connecting health providers through a network, there's greater opportunities to be able to garner from those different providers reliable evidence about the kind of services that they're providing and the quality of those services. Those networks may also facilitate the distribution of subsidies, which could be particularly important if we're thinking about how government can purchase services from private providers. So on the one hand, there's huge potential from those networks, but on the other hand, we're concerned that the networks can create monopolies and also exert political influence that may not always be for the good. So we may also think about how best to manage the growth of those networks going forward. Finally, and as I said earlier, one of our core themes was about promoting learning in health markets. We feel that this is important, and you'll see that this is already embedded in many of the different um, issues that I've discussed to date. But overall, we felt that better coordination and more consolidated research on health markets is needed. We had some discussions at Bellagio about what might be the real priorities in terms of research and learning for health markets. We thought that regulatory approaches were important, greater understanding about the effects of information on consumer behavior in health markets, and also about the potential for mobile and informational technologies. But I don't think that we felt that we were a good group to reach any kind of agreement or conclusion in terms of research priorities, but we would love to see greater focus on this in the future. What we did want to say, though, was that we need more alternative evaluation approaches and more real-time learning. We recognize that markets are so dynamic and continuously shifting that we can't have very sort of standard impact evaluation types approaches. We need more implementation research and more real-time approaches that can help guide approaches uh, to health markets as they evolve. So finally, I just want to say a few words about next steps and how we envisage taking this work forward in the future. Many of you will be aware of the handshake grouping of interested partners working on how best to harness the non-state sector um, for health. And we'd like to propose that Hanshep establish a knowledge priorities group that can begin to establish some of the research priorities in terms of health markets and develop more coordinated approaches to garnering necessary evidence. We'd also like to explore the potential to collaborate with developing country governments to pilot some of the data collection systems that I referred to earlier and the sort of platform that could pull together different types of information about health markets. We propose the development of a challenge fund that could support experimentation and learning on health markets. So that kind of challenge fund could both help support the development of new regulatory interventions and learning about what's effective and what's working in a real-time kind of way around those regulations. Finally, we recognize that the group that came together in Bellagio was not fully representative of all the different actors who it's really important to bring to the table when we're talking about health markets. So we'd like to find ways to broaden the debate and in particular to include a broader array of market actors in this discussion. And I think that this webinar is a really important first step in terms of being able to do just that. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like now to turn to our panel of uh, speakers. And as you know, we have four different speakers who are going to react to some of the things that came out of the uh, Bellagio meeting. 
Um, and our first speaker is actually uh, Dr. Alan uh, Pamba. Um, Alan works with Gla GlaxoSmithKline as Director of Public Engagement and Access Initiatives for the Developing Countries and Mar Market Access Unit. Um, and his role there is focused on driving sustainable delivery of medicines and vaccines to developing countries, and in particular trying to use um, innovative business models to do that. Um, so he's tasked with directing GSK's external engagement, setting up these kind of innovative initiatives, um, and to enhance access to medicines and vaccines across 50 countries, including the UN 48 least developed countries. Um, and originally, Alan is from Kenya, and he trained there as a physician. So um, over to you, Alan. Thank you very much, Sarah. Wonderful opportunity to be able to make a few comments on the, the larger statement on future health markets. When I read this, uh, you know, I, I found the piece very timely in the sense that if you look at what's going on in the landscape, and I'm, I'm going to focus a lot more on Africa because I've got a personal interest on the least developed countries, which of which uh, actually fall in Africa. So when you look at what's happening in that landscape, since the global economic downturn, donor funding to projects across sectors, including the health sector, has declined. And with this decline in donor funding, what we're seeing is the creation of a niche, which I think will be filled by the private sector. So the role of the private sector in future health markets is going to be increasingly important and will require much sharper definition. So this paper becomes quite relevant for that one reason. The second reason why I think it's quite relevant is because Africa, as a subject, is actually rising on boardroom agendas for a number of multinational companies, including the health sector. So it's moving from, you know, right at the bottom, any other business, philanthropy discussion right at the end of the agenda, if there is time, to sort of middle of the agenda, you know, where is our Africa strategy, you know, and it's got to be robust, Africa being perceived now as the last frontier of growth. And what's driving that is that for a number of multinational companies, including the one that I work for, what we're seeing is either plateauing or decline in growth in Europe, US. Now, those markets still remain very, very important for us but they're not where we're going to find our future growth. And also, if you look at what's happened in the current BRIC countries, so the India, China, uh, et cetera, the companies that go into those markets really early and establish themselves really early and grew with the market have commanding market share, you know, today. And it's very hard to shift that today, regardless of how much resources you throw at it. They, they were there earlier, and they got established earlier. Now, lessons emanating for what's happened in the emerging market space are getting transferred to the least developed country space, the developing country space, and companies are recognizing that if you're going to do well in Africa in the next 20, 30 years, you've got to be getting in there today. So again, for that second reason, the Bellagio statement is, is really timely in terms of just where things are going. My key takeaway from this statement is that there's a burning platform to build a vision for what future health market will look like in Africa. And we have an opportunity to begin to create an enabling environment for that vision. And hopefully that's what we start now and continue to do in the you know, many months, years to follow. So the private sector health agenda community, if I may refer to it as that, has a number of challenges, opportunities, risks that uh, we need to be aware of. Probably three risks jump at me. The first one is a cultural shift that is required among stakeholders to appreciate the new role of the private sector in the future health market. So if I may give a very specific example here, if you look at the relationship between the private sector and, say, the NGO community, it has been traditionally one where you give a donation and you step back and the NGO community who are much more permeated in society or actually in the society that you know, we're all trying to get, you know, get through to, will implement programs. We're getting into a phase where there is need to truly thought partner. Uh, we are interested in reaching last mile patients. Uh, we are interested in addressing the health sector infrastructure and all the other barriers that stop us from reaching the last mile patients. So the private sector really will have an increasingly important role to play in healthcare delivery in developing countries, more than just you know being present as a trader. So that's one challenge, so getting a cultural shift to understand that new role of the private sector. The other challenge is around alignment on the ideal approach. 
I think it will be really important for the private sector health agenda community to sharply define what the issues are, agree on what those are, and then agree on how to take them forward. And that's not an easy task in itself. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of players, there's a lot of interest, and coming to a consensus position is what is required, but really, really challenging. Health is still low on the agenda of least developed country government, and we have a task here to try and get it higher up on the agenda. So clearly, most people will know that it's only a handful of countries that have met their budget declaration of getting about 15% of GDP spend on health. I think unless you get government committing to that degree, then it's really difficult for them to be a much more active and useful player or optimize their role in trying to help shape future health markets and create an enabling environment through that. I think there's lots of opportunities that we need to be optimistic about. So the first one, I guess, is a bit of a double-edged sword, and that's the global economic downturn that we saw sort of 2007, 2008 onwards. What this has done is I think it's reduced the public sector funding, which is articulated earlier on, is creating a niche that needs to be filled, uh, and the private sector is an opportunity to fill that niche. There's a growing appetite to develop a strategy for Africa amongst multinational companies. And we know that you know, these are companies that can bring in financial muscle that will help move things you know, fairly briskly. You know, if you look at the top five pharmaceutical industry companies, uh, the annual turnover of the top five is about 20% of sub-Saharan Africa's GDP. But that is significant. Uh, if they're looking to have a bigger presence in Africa, then I think there is an opportunity there that can be leveraged. The rising middle class in Africa is clearly attractive for the private sector uh, and an opportunity that, again, will require to be leveraged. A rise of NCDs as an increasing challenge in, in developing countries. The beauty of NCDs is that the solutions actually, in many instances, have already been developed in the West. And what we need to do is just bridge into Africa, uh, bridge through repurposing some of the medicine to, to be relevant to those populations and bridge through supporting the development of infrastructure, which in itself is a big challenge, uh, but non nonetheless, I think, achievable, given that this is already existing model that um, we can learn from. Technology also presents a wonderful opportunity that uh, could be leveraged, again, you know, in terms of beginning to, to shape what future health markets will look like. So I think lots of opportunities, but I think a, a risk that stands out for me is that all this will require really strong leadership to drive in order that uh, the future markets are shaped in a timely fashion and more people are able to access much better healthcare sooner rather than later. In terms of critical next steps, there are three that stand out for me. The first one will really be around a sharp of framing of the issues you know, that uh, need addressing in order to shape the future health market effectively. And you know, some of this come out in the Bellagio statement, but others probably less sharply. So I think there's an opportunity to really give a, a sharper edge to what these issues are. The, the issues around innovation, uh, health worker gaps, the data gaps that have been discussed in the statement, infrastructure gaps, or you know, the role of government. Uh, in particular, the regulatory role of government and what that should look like going forward. The clear responsibility for that will, you know, getting this sharper definition of what the issues are, will stick with the private sector health agenda community. Similarly, there will be need for robust advocacy to get health higher up on the agenda of government. As already articulated, unless, you know, you get government increasing their spend on health, that commitment towards shaping future health markets is not as strong as it can be. But when a significant proportion of you know, government budget goes to health, then it becomes something which is clearly a national interest on and, and a clear need to kind of shape how that's going. Again, I think the private sector health agenda community has a role to play in defining what that advocacy would look like. And finally, funding organizations can act as catalysts that can drive change through targeted support, you know, plugging some of the gaps that have been identified. Data, you know, lack of data is a big gap in, in Africa. A lot of companies would like to go in, a lot of, you know, private sector would like to set up, but because the data is not there, 
they have no visibility of what the opportunity really is. And supporting plugging some of those data gaps will really help drive even stronger interest than we're seeing today. Infrastructure gap, everybody will be interested in addressing this. The private sector itself that's looking to grow within that environment, uh, governments that are looking to reach last mile patients, and, and clearly I think you know, the, the funding organizations, again, have a role to, to play in sort of helping catalyze that process. And of course, innovation. You know, there's some bad innovation coming out of Africa at the moment. I think there's an opportunity to support greater innovation. I think there's opportunity to also support innovation that is promising to come to scale. So again, funding organizations such as Handshap will probably have a big role to play in catalyzing this change. So those really are the few remarks that I had on the Bellagio statement. I think it's a wonderful start, and I think we need to keep the energy high uh, for us to really drive change in terms of just helping to shape future health markets for developing countries. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alan, um, and I think that was particularly helpful for us to hear about how the corporate sector is currently perceiving these sort of uh, global uh, dynamics and shifts between different countries, and particularly the opportunities for health markets in the, in the sub-Saharan African uh, region. So I, I, I agree with you entirely that we continue to need to sharpen the focus and sharpen our ideas about what really needs to be um, addressed here. Um, but I'd like to move on and ask uh, Dr. Kwesi Bahini um, to speak next. Uh, Kwesi is the Director of Advocacy and Program Development at the Health Insurance Fund, and he has extensive experience in international development, development economics, uh, public health, and HIV-AIDS. And uh, recently, he's been exploring a variety of mechanisms to ensure greater access to health services and uh, pharmaceuticals. So over to you, Kwesi. And thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and uh, uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. And thanks a lot also to the organizers for connecting me with this seminar. Uh, I couldn't be in Bellagio, but I've had the opportunity to, uh, to read the report. And I agree with uh, Alan that it's, it's, it's really a wonderful uh, report, uh, emphasizing uh, the role of the private sector and what can be done to develop uh, health markets. And uh, what I'm going to uh, share with you will draw uh, a lot on my own experience, but also the work uh, of Farm Access and Health Insurance Fund in promoting access to quality of care uh, to low-income people in South Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Farm Access and Health Insurance Fund uh, support private sector development and public-private partnerships uh, in healthcare. And I. So, you know, back to my presentation, I am of the opinion that uh, healthcare is a public good and the governments um, have a responsibility uh, to ensure that uh, their citizens uh, obtain access uh, to uh, good quality care. But, of course, you know, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, what you see is that uh, about 25% uh, of the population uh, only 25% uh, of the population uh, have access to some kind of uh, quality care. And of course, uh, the reasons uh, are numerous. Uh, among them is the chronic lack of resources uh, for healthcare. So if you compare Sub-Saharan Africa to developing, uh, developing countries, what you see is that in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, health expenditure per capita is about $30 compared to over $4,000 in developed countries. Supporting and involving the private sector in the delivery of healthcare, I think it's essential and it should also be seen as complementary to the efforts of the government and the public healthcare sector. A challenging thing uh, is that in most uh, sub-Saharan Af African countries, because uh, laws and rights are not enforced, what you see is that the rich people are mostly people who obtain access to healthcare uh, through the public sector. And actually, you know, public sector services are meant to promote equity and ensure that uh, poor people 
and receive access. But you know, you have the opposite in countries like Nigeria and Uganda, where over 60 percent of poor people and receive um, access to care to the private um, sector, and considerable lot of them, and uh, the rich people obtain it from from the public uh, sector. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Um, what um, fascinates me is that uh, the report uh, at Bellagio uh, emphasizes some key and fundamental issues which need uh, to be tackled in order to uh, ensure that you know we attain universal uh, healthcare coverage for the poor, but also ensure that you know healthcare contributes. Healthcare leads actually to improved uh, health outcomes uh, for the poor people. So, yeah. uh, I, I lost I, I lost the slide. That's why uh, the hiccup. So the the the, the first uh, crucial point, which um, the larger report emphasizes. Is the fact is the fact that we should see uh, health markets as a situation where supply and demand apply, and citizens uh, make choices. And I think um, the second part of it, emphasizing the choice that citizens could make, is very crucial because in our work we have seen that where citizens can make choices, it contributes to efficiency. And also effectiveness in the delivery of care. I also concur the fact that addressing failures in healthcare markets can help minimize financial risks and improve the capacity to deliver quality. You know, you could look at financial risks at, uh, from two perspectives. One is ensuring that there is financial protection for consumers, but also at the provider side, ensuring that providers do have a steady stream of income. Availability of data and effective analysis, I think, have been emphasized uh, by Sarah. And I do uh, support uh, the point of view. I think the most unfortunate thing here, if you look at, you know, over 30 years of, 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 of or 40 years of and supporting uh, healthcare programs is that most donor programs have not put emphasis on uh, data on and on research. You know, in most cases, they look at uh, short-term uh, programs. And one of the uh, private organizations, which in my view has done a lot to change uh, that perspective, is the Gates Foundation. You know, of which I've also, I also have the privilege uh, to be involved. Uh, in, in so many capacities in my previous work. I support also um, the view shared by the Bellagio report that we need also to uh, build community of practice. And I add to that uh, by saying that, you know, what is crucial for the community of practice to be able to deliver on the long term is to invest in capacity building, uh, invest in policy making and research, and the development of business models at local level. And what we've tried to do in our work um, in Nigeria, but also in other countries, is to support uh, local, whether they are local policy officers, uh, NGOs, or people uh, from uh, the private sector to come together and share experiences and we've seen that in Nigeria, for example, and uh, Quara State, that you know, government officials are now talking about developing healthcare financing plan, which you know, uh, from the basis looks at how they could mobilize domestic resources. And I think that's that's really a, a wonderful uh, achievement. Our contribution to the Bellagio uh, statement. Uh, First of all, um, what we think is that there are some fundamental 
uh, risks which need to be addressed in order to uh, ensure that poor people have access to good quality care, but also to ensure that you know private investors will invest in healthcare. And one is that governments and donors have the responsibility to do something about investment risks and also stimulate trust uh, in the system. What we also see is that as donor funding moves uh, to healthcare, we see a substitution effect where you know government reduces uh, its own funding or in some cases government funding uh, over uh, crowds out uh, spending uh, from the private sector. You could also, uh, and I think that point has been emphasized by Sarah, but I will uh, emphasize it here again, uh, that is the role of government in developing effective regulation. What you've seen in Kenya, for example, is that on the one hand, the government uh, wants to stimulate healthcare development, private sector participation, but at the same time, the government comes with a very stringent regulation which sort of stifles uh, the private sector. For example, if you are a health insurance and company and you want to uh, set up an insurance, uh, you want to get involved in even supporting uh, programs for poor people, you are required by law to put up or come up with a huge solvency uh, requirement. And you see that most uh, healthcare companies do not meet those requirements. And certainly then they cannot go ahead and uh, engage in the programs which, you know, at the end of the day will benefit the poor people. I think the second point has been emphasized, so it will not require much, uh, uh, I don't need to say it so much about it. And uh, the private sector is important uh, in the delivery of healthcare. Um, there's a WHO publication, the Atlas of Healthcare, which emphasizes here that in 21 sub-Saharan African countries, over 40% of the poor people get their access to care from the private sector. Access to capital is certainly important. Technical assistance vital uh, to improving quality of care, particularly when it comes to engaging the small and medium uh, clinics, pharmaceuticals, and hospitals. Promoting uh, public-private partnerships in healthcare, we feel, is also key. What we've seen here is that when you bring public and private uh, stakeholders together, first of all, you are able to encourage risk sharing we are also able to encourage innovation, participation, uh, effectiveness, and we've also been able to uh, show these uh, types of uh, partnerships in Lagos, but also in the middle of Nigeria, uh, Kwara, where you know parties are coming together, discussing steps uh, of ensuring uh, risk sharing. And certainly, they have the support of uh, the state government uh, in doing that. A, a critical remark from my side uh, is that when I read the Bellagio report, I thought that it uh, overestimated uh, the importance of development partners in the development of healthcare markets. And certainly, uh, it's true that there are some initiatives which cannot be carried out because of limited funding from donors. But I think if you're looking at the delivery of healthcare in the long term, then certainly we need to look at how we can support uh, local institutions to first and foremost mobilize domestic resources and use those resources effectively. And then we can also look at the support that can come from and uh, the donor countries. What we've also seen here is that uh, it is sometimes important to use the donor funding as a leverage. Uh, 
to mobilize more resources. Discussions on healthcare package uh, for universal healthcare uh, should be central to initiatives and policies for developing uh, health markets. You know, as a kid in Ghana, uh, somewhere in uh, you know in the primary school in 1972, and uh, the government of Ghana went to Geneva, you know, where all the countries met, and then they signed a declaration saying that by the year 2000, uh, every Ghanaian will have access to primary care. You know, we are now in 2013, and less than uh, half of the population uh, have access to care. The fundamental problem has been that uh, universal health coverage has not been an integral part of most policies. You know, uh, people only look at it from a healthcare perspective, but you could also look at, you know, uh, the industry required healthy population to achieve that. We haven't looked at it in an integrated way where, you know, first of all, you will look at uh, the needs of the people, you will look at the capacity to deliver, and the capacity to deliver should not only come from uh, the health sector, but from the economy, from agriculture, because they are all uh, linked. And of course, what is important is the financing. And I strongly believe that the financing should be an integrated uh, mechanism where we look at mobilizing uh, domestic resources you know, into an inclusive scheme to ensure that poor people can get access to services but also, you know, supporting it, like the point I made earlier, that uh, donor support will complement uh, what they have been able to mobilize from domestic uh, resources. I think that is, this is where I will end uh, the presentation, and if there are questions, I can uh, take them later on. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kwasi. And I think you've um, thrown out some challenges there that might be well addressed to our next speaker. Um, you were talking about the need for government to stimulate trust, to develop an appropriate investment environment, and regulations that don't stifle the private uh, sector. Um, and obviously those are things that government uh, perhaps would like to respond to. But before I uh, hand over to our next speaker, I just wanted to remind um, all the participants that we welcome your questions, your comments upon the discussion so far. Um, you can either um, enter your questions through the questions tab, in the GoToWebinar control panel. You can see the third tab down is questions. Please type in there. Also, um, you can tweet, and we are monitoring our uh, hashtag, which is HealthMKT. So please do begin to think of questions and comments and send them to us. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kalechi Ohiri. Um, Kalechi is the Senior Special Advisor to the Honorable Minister of State for Health in Nigeria and uh, head of the delivery unit in the Ministry of Health. Um, prior to this, he worked in the London office of McKinsey and Company um, on health sector issues. And he's also been a health specialist at the World Bank Group um, in Washington, DC. Uh, Kalechi has written uh, numerous policy papers, academic publications, including an intriguing one that starts with the title, Clearing the Global Health Fog. Um, Kalechi has a medical degree from the University of Lagos and an MPH and MS degrees from uh, Harvard. So uh, over to you, Kalechi, for our next uh, uh, contribution. Thank you very much, um, Sarah. So can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. OK, perfect. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, I was at the large and I had the privilege of being there and I um, just want to say that the work that the future um, health systems group is doing with regards to looking at future health markets it's really timely and extremely relevant from a policymaker's perspective um, and I'll try to tailor this um, few comments of mine um, to bring in to bear the country's perspective as we've heard the several perspectives and um, the outline of my presentation will focus on first giving just an overview of the health sector by way of the background um, and bearing highlighting some of the constraints we face in like looking at the health markets and then secondly um, just give a little bit of a run through some of the interventions from the 
government or regulatory perspective we've tried to undertake to address some of these market constraints. And then thirdly, reflecting on some of the perspectives from the Bellagio meeting and some suggestions of things that could be done to move this agenda forward. And um, just want to start by saying that Nigeria, um, like many other countries, is a very heterogeneous, complex country with six. So instructive about Nigeria is the fact that constitutional is a federal structure, meaning that the states are fiscally devolved and as such have their own mini healthcare markets and mini healthcare systems that they run. There are 774 local government and almost 10,000 wards, which are sort of like independent administrative units of the government. The health care is the responsibility of all the three tiers of government, the federal, the state, and the local government, and as such constitutionally is placed on the concurrent list. The disadvantage of that is that if health care is everyone's responsibility, it may sometimes fall through the cracks and become nobody's responsibility in general. Um, when we started looking at the health market in Nigeria more comprehensively about two years ago, what we found was a healthcare system that was underperforming. So health outcomes were suboptimal with lots of inequalities in health outcomes and the quality of services provided was quite poor. The second thing we found was that we had so many healthcare facilities, it was a highly fragmented system and the private sector accounted for at least 50% of healthcare provision. So that forced us to re-examine the lens through which we engage the health market from moving away from looking at interventions of markets from a pure public sector perspective, but looking at it as a system where you have a mixture of both private and public. And within the private, uh, the entire spectrum of you know, players from the small, tiny, little uh, informal provider to the very sophisticated, well-organized uh, private sector providers. The third thing that we found was also the fact that um, there was insufficient protection from financial risk, and this influenced the level of demand generation for health services that you'll find, particularly amongst the poor. And on the flip side, we found that while we recognized the need to engage the private sector, if you looked historically at how the government has actually engaged, there were gaps, especially with terms of in the areas of financing, in the areas of regulation, and in the areas of information exchange. So the little diamond there looks at where Nigeria is um, compared to the South Saharan Africa average, as well as what the ideal should be. And that sort of demonstrates a suboptimal level of engagement with the private sector. This is also um, captured in the chat below, where you see the time the bit to do things like enforce a contract and then looking at the business environment for the health market to function and for the private sector across all levels to function leaves much to be desired. So this was sort of the picture that we were hit with um, when we um, started. So and then looking at the health markets, we found that there were several market failures that you know we found in the health sector. The first bullet point there looks at the supply side, the second look at the demand side of a critical constraint, which is the access to finance. On the supply side, like I mentioned, we have a very fragmented private health sector, very small scale, not scalable, and poor quality of care in the facilities, health workforce issues, and just the usual things that you would find in many healthcare markets across the, the continent. On the demand side, we found that accessing finance was a major problem just because I mean, many of the private health institutions were unable to qualify for any form of financial assistance that was structured, either due to financial, business, management, or just basic capacity constraints. The third bucket looks at the issue about public sector engagement. Whereas if you look at other sectors that are non-health, there is a form of level of organization that you have where engagement with the public sector is quite structured and there's an ongoing dialogue. We didn't find that in the health sector. There's minimal formal engagement, the private providers are not well organized, and therefore the level of advocacy was suboptimal. And the last bucket point is more of like, you know, government's role as the last speaker um, highlighted. 
the current regulations as were historically developed almost on the blind eye to the current nature of the healthcare market. They don't foster private sector development. Standards were such that they were not properly enforced. So the actual um, user of healthcare does not have a way of, of being assured of quality. So you have someone who has invested a lot of money in, a, in providing qualitative care competing with the informal provider on almost like equal terms. So that market failure also um, existed, practic bottlenecks that one sees as captured in the previous um, slides. So let's try to move to the next slide. Now, when we found all this, the government realized that it had a role to play in addressing some of these constraints. And some of those levers were not just um, regulatory. There were several levers that the government needed to bring to bear. So we identified sort of like you know, five separate like you know, work streams based on extensive consultation with different stakeholders in the healthcare space in Nigeria, both public and private. One was looking at fiscal and monetary policy issues because some of the things that impact the healthcare market are not healthcare specific regulations, but the health sector becomes um, a victim of regulations and policies that are made in the broader macroeconomy. For instance, things related to taxation and tariffs for medical equipment, for consumables, etc. The second thing was the regulatory environment where there was a need for clarification and development of proper quality standards and accreditation system that would assure quality and also um, ensure that the interpretation of these laws and these policies were consistent and applied to everyone. The third thing was the access to capital issue which we've mentioned. And then the fourth was to actually demonstrate through public-private engagement what could actually work within the context of the current regulatory structure and actually demonstrate model um, examples of that level of interaction. And then the last one was engaging the broader private sector to raise the profile of the health sector or to do things that will have positive impact on the health sector as a whole. Now, there were certain specific things that um, the Bellagio meeting um, resonated with um, when um, I read the document and I also participated in the meeting. The first thing was in just the shaping of the questions or the issues, right? Certain things that applied in the Nigerian context. Most of these issues were familiar and things like the fact that health markets are heterogeneous. And I just showed you the map of Nigeria. But in fact, within that market, you had several sub-markets and different archetypes of healthcare markets at play within that market. So the boundaries of a health market need to be defined. And you find out that there are several archetypes that could apply across countries, um, depending on how closely we look at them. The second thing was that, you know, and this is a point that Sarah made, which is that these things will not be static. The health sector is a complex and adaptive system that's responding to a lot of demand and changing preferences, et cetera. So that, that brings me to the second point, that it's not a question of, you know, um, what if. It's a question of when um, should we be involved. The health markets will remain um, pervasive. They will remain complex adaptive systems. There will be pressures on governments, both internally with a more demanding population that wants a health market that is responsive to their needs. And in Nigeria, we see that given the rate of outbound medical tourism where people go to other countries like India you know, and Europe for healthcare services. And also externally, you know, from the international community with the move towards universal coverage. So there is a lot of pressure that is being exerted on governments to become more responsive or also respond um, to this system and not play catch up like um, historically governments are wants to do. So there is a window of opportunity now for governments um, to act. And um, if we don't seize that, then the, sec the health markets might evolve in a way that may not necessarily guarantee an improvement of outcomes, especially for those at the bottom of the pyramid. A third thing that came out of the um, Bellagio statement was the fact that information was key 
several sources of data are being collected in country service, etc. But the lack of routine data remains a challenge. And this is data that's needed both from the public sector and the private sector that will enhance the stewardship function of government and not just data that tells you about the impact um, of specific interventions five years down the line. And the last thing that came up was the need for innovation. From a policymaker's perspective, there's need for regulatory innovation. In Nigeria, um, one of the ways this has played out is, first of all, the, for the first time in the history of the country, the health sector has a seat on the highest policy-making decision body, the economic management team and the economic management implementation team, so that regulations that are made at the macro level, we would have an input into that and see how they impact the sector um, so that we will not be playing catch-up. The second thing is, you know, we have the federal um, government with the president launched a Saving One Million Lives initiative, which focuses on a different approach to delivery that is based on using data and information through tools like scorecards to keep the different federated entities accountable for outcomes. And these are some of the innovations that have come up from a regulatory perspective. And other things under development are looking at performance-based financing mechanisms where disbursements are linked to specific outcomes. And there are other elements of innovation that you know, resonated from the Bellagio statements, such as you know, the labor market dynamics and not just you know, what to do with the task shifting and the crop of the health workers that are being trained, who may become tomorrow's informal health workers, but also how do we leverage the African diaspora who are in Europe and in America and other countries to meet some of the critical resource needs uh, and human resource needs in the countries and what business models will make that happen. The third is the fact that there's an opportunity for other business models from other countries, for instance, low-cost business models that um, you find in other countries like India, for instance, that may be relevant especially for targeting the poor in countries like Nigeria. So these are just some of the LMP elements of things that resonated and a lot more actually did. And I think in order to move this forward, so I think I may have just, yes, um, there are just four things I want to highlight. One is the need for research agenda to generate the evidence and information in health markets. I mean, there's a need to move beyond ideology and actually focus on what works. That's what is helpful to policymakers. Um, of course, in an original position, one can determine based on an ideology, the type of health system one wants, whether it's public, private, mixed, etc. But most policy makers find themselves in a situation where you already have healthcare markets that are developed and that are evolving. And there is a dire need for rigorous research that can help inform policymakers in making very strategic decisions. Secondly, I mean, we can use country labs um, to test some of these regulatory innovations and also that bring into consideration the contextual factors. We can't do randomized control trials because it might not be politically feasible. But I know that um, one of the things we, I mentioned is our willingness in Nigeria, for instance, to serve as you know, an innovation lab to test some of these um, regulatory innovations. And it's in the light of the opportunity of the burning platform we have to actually test this. The third thing I think Kwasi also mentioned was the need for a community of practice for sharing experiences and also learnings, but also learning what did not work well in other contexts so that we don't have to repeat the same mistakes. And I think having this community of practice, whether it's through handshake or other entities, will be helpful in disseminating this information across countries. And then the last point I'll make is on linking all these initiatives to results, right, using accountability frameworks. I know, for instance, there are current ongoing discussions about creating a Pan-African scorecard using the um, working with ALMA. Um, we are currently uh, have a scorecard developed within Nigeria for um, looking at MNCH interventions, for instance, and bringing um, both legislators, governors to account using this as a tool. And now it might help to actually have expand this and look at other frameworks and methods for accountability because as health systems evolve, the onus is on government to ensure that its, you know, its primary role 
at improving the outcomes of people are not, you know, subsumed within the evolution of healthcare markets, and that we also keep focus on improving outcomes for the poor and improving equity of services and all the other public good functions that we want the healthcare system to play. So ensuring that we are being held accountable and all the players are being held accountable remains important. Um, I think that is all I have um, to present, but I welcome comments at the end of um, these um, presentations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kalechi. That was great. <clears throat> and I think it helped um, take some of the ideas that we had in uh, Balajo and put them in a very concrete uh, context of Nigeria. So I, I'd like to move to our um, final speaker, uh, Guy Stallworthy. Um, Guy is uh, currently at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which he joined uh, the foundation in January 2007 after 11 years in social marketing with um, Population Services International. Um, He's had a number of long-term assignments, including in Burma um, and also Bangladesh, Chad, Bolivia, and he has master's degrees in international affairs and in public health. And Guy, um, before I hand over to you, there's some questions that have come in on Twitter really about the role of um, government financing in uh, health markets. And I know that sort of Alan said in his presentation that he thought that um, government government financing for health may um, decline over time and that we, I'd be interested in your view on that and sort of more generally the links between health markets and um, equity and services for the poor. So if you're able to weave that into your comments that would be uh, wonderful. So Guy, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I was also lucky enough to participate in the Bellagio meeting, which I found extremely useful. And I think the statement came at a, a, at a useful time in the Gates Foundation as we're try, trying to uh, develop our strategies for contributing to uh, primary health care. Um, at the Gates Foundation, we've been quite comfortable for some time now thinking about uh, uh, global markets for specific technologies. Uh, including, of course, those for which we've invested in the research and development, but even for others too. So whether it's for a specific vaccine such as rotavirus or for a new TB diagnostic or for older technologies such as Zinc RS or ACTs, um, we've been working with, if you like, the whole value chain of uh, how to shape a healthy market for these products at the global level thinking about manufacturing cost, demand forecasting, pools procurement, standards and regulation, and, and institutions such as Gavi, the Global Fund, and Unity that, that play a part in that. But um, the second sense in which uh, we're applying the concept of markets is, is for us a little more recent when we turn our attention to uh, specific geographies and we engage with governments in Nigeria or Ethiopia or the states of northern India to think about how to contribute towards better primary health care. And there, um, there what I've noticed is that um, uh, we're generally much more comfortable uh, using the language of systems, health systems and system dynamics. And um, it seems that um, Thinking about market, using market language is uh, something that uh, makes some people uncomfortable. Uh, and and, and I um, we'll, don't want to dwell too much because we haven't got that much time, but uh, a, a couple of slides that, um, that, that, that illustrate the point I'm trying to make here. And uh, uh, perhaps Jeff could help me with uh, uh, changing the slide. But yeah, thank you, that's good. So the um, first point I want to make is it does seem to me at least that um, there's uh, nothing incompatible between the notion of believing that healthcare delivery can be understood as a mixed public and private market with some of the features of markets and also implicit in that understanding or believing that some things are best done by non-state actors in a, in a mixed health system. That doesn't seem to me to be incompatible with a number of other beliefs, such as uh, those on the right-hand slide here, that, uh, that um, 
people have a right to decent health care, then it's ultimately uh, the responsibility of the state. And in particular, uh, separating out financing from provision. So the notion that uh, uh, collective public or mandatory funding is the most equitable way to, and efficient way to finance health care. Um, it uh, seems to be one around which is a fair amount of consensus that we, uh, that we at the Gates Foundation also share. And, and so uh, I think uh, understanding that health is a market is not incompatible with the belief that public financing needs to, absolutely needs to increase in absolute terms and as a proportion of the total. Um, but it's also not incompatible with understanding that market outcomes are um, often, if not probably usually, um, far from ideal and, and may uh, and indeed do uh, result in uh, uh, inequity. Um, also, of course, that uh, people are uh, not only motivated by profit uh, and that privatization doesn't have to be a goal in order to uh, think in terms of markets. And, and so with respect to the, the private sector, which is, is, is uh, obviously a feature of a, of, a, of a mixed health system, and if Jeff could help me move the slide, it, it seems that um, these two sets of uh, beliefs on this slide are also not incompatible with each other. On the one hand, we can recognize um, all the problems inherent with uh, market-based private provision uh, that I won't bother to read, but but at the same time, we can recognize uh, the strengths of private players and private markets and the extent to which uh, there are opportunities presented by the dynamism of, uh, of private markets. And so both of these kinds of beliefs seem to me to be uh, possible to hold them both at the same time. Um, a, de uh, a desire to use market concepts uh, as we work to improve uh, equity in primary health care um, does not seem to me to be incompatible with uh, uh, a, a deep understanding that governments need to um, intervene in markets if they're going to have uh, more equitable outcomes than, than at present. Also with the fact that uh, markets are composed of both public and private players, that public providers are actors in the market just as much as private uh, players. Um, indeed, the poor tend to have been pretty poorly served by both public and private uh, providers uh, in most of the countries that we're concerned with for contrasting reasons. Um, but um, um, the, the, the goal of public policy being to, uh, to intervene uh, to improve that uh, equitable outcomes in both in, in mixed health systems. So. Um, to finish up quickly, so there's more time for discussion perhaps, uh, we're certainly uh, hoping to improve our understanding of trends in, 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 in health markets, in mixed health markets, understood as composed of public and private and hybrid uh, actors, to think clearly about um, business models, again, public and private business models that uh, might perform better for the poor. And, uh, and hopefully to develop a language that enables us all to talk about these things uh, uh, without, um, without discomfort or without uh, alienating people who, who think one way or another. So I, I think uh, I should stop there so, uh, and, uh, and, and turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you very much in, indeed, Guy. Um, and thank you also for keeping it brief because we are um, quite short on time. Um, this slide here tells you how to submit questions, and we do welcome your questions, so please go to the webinar control panel and submit them, or um, submit via Twitter using the hashtag. But I thought that I might throw out um, some of the questions that came, um, came in in advance of this webinar, and several people e emailed us in advance. And maybe if I can just um, throw out several of those questions so that our panelists and um, other speakers can chip in. Um, so there's one from uh, Bruce McKay at HLSP saying, you know, we've got a strong focus in the Bellagio statement on improving evidence and data availability, but his argument is that people often don't use the data that is already available, and maybe we need to focus more on creating uh, demand. 
for that evidence amongst planners and, and policy makers. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, and then please do raise your hand to, to respond. Um, there was also a couple of questions that came in about um, the uh, growth of networks and the challenges that this created. And I, I mentioned that in, my, uh, in the initial presentation. Um, and the question really is, what can we do to prevent powerful players from creating monopolies and from um, controlling the market in a way that might not be in the public good? Um, other questions are Chima and Noka. Uh, that last one about the, uh, the powerful players came from Michael Rodriguez at APT. And Chima and Noka from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. This was really, I think, a question targeted at Kalechi about what's the right level of government to engage with health markets, particularly in sort of large federated states such as Nigeria. Should we be looking at state governments, federal government, uh, local government? What are their different roles? And then finally, a question from uh, Tom Feely at Hanshep about you know, what's really meant by this idea of health market learning labs and challenge funds. Is it possible for someone to expand a little bit on um, what's meant by that? So um, those are some of the questions that have come in so far. Uh, if you're interested in responding, if possible, raise your hand so that I can uh, direct the discussion. Anyone willing to take on any of those uh, questions thrown out there? Uh, Kalechi, maybe I could come to you and ask you for a response just about the one about the appropriate level of government to um, engage with uh, private health markets. If you can give a, keep your response fairly brief, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, just to rephrase the question, so it's, the question is on the right level of government to engage with health markets. And in Nigeria, it's a federal system, and so it means that to engage with markets, you have to look at both the federal and the state level. A lot of times, with regards to registration of private health facilities, etc., that's a state level function. So at the state level, there is a responsibility of the state governments to register new facilities that are being set up, etc., and regulate assure quality, etc. But also that same um, that same policy also mandates the federal government to be responsible for tertiary care and to have a supervisory role on primary health care, for instance. So there are some policies that are at the state level, but at the national level there are also some policies that mandates the federal government to, to do that. So that said, that's on one hand. On the other hand, in terms of engaging to correct certain market failures, certain access issues, given that within the country there are some areas that the market failures will not allow providers to play in, and then there are some areas where for other things of public good nature, one needs to intervene. I think the federal government is best placed to do that and has been doing that. Um, so I'll just stop there, and if there's further clarification needed, I can provide. Thank you very much indeed, um, Um Maybe I can comment on the sort of questions about um, people not using the evidence that is available. And it might even link a little bit to um, Tom Fina's question about health market learning labs. I mean, I, I think that the question is spot on in terms of the nature of evidence use, and we have quite a lot of research now that suggests that often policy and decision makers are not using the evidence available to them. But I think that the kind of models that we were thinking about in Bellagio were ones where um, researchers would work more closely with policy and decision makers to help understand the questions that needed to be answered in terms of the appropriate policy directions and um, programmatic directions that they needed to move in. And, um, to work in a kind of a way where we could generate information about um, experiments within health markets, whether that's regulatory experiments or new business models, and to generate real-time um, data around what's going on. So I think that kind of philosophy of a more collaborative approach to generating and using evidence reflects our understanding that um, 
you know, often there's a real disjuncture between what's done in the research and uh, data world and what's done in the policy and programmatic world. And we need to get the, and the barriers to bringing those two communities more closely together are often to do with the fact that research isn't framed in the right way to answer the right question, that evidence generated is not necessarily timely. And so um, some of the things that we were thinking about under, for example, the Health Market Learning Lab would be trying to bridge those communities and engage in generating evidence that really fit with um, an, uh, an evidence needs on the policy side. Um, so panelists, please raise your hand if you have other things to mention. We, I wanted to just refer to one of the questions that has come in from Adam Kuhn about, um, you mentioned that private providers are not well organized and don't typically engage with the public sector. Do professional associations or state medical nursing societies participate in collective bargaining or with the public sector? Or perhaps more generally, you know, what's the role of some of these professional associations in terms of helping to mediate these health, uh, health market relationships? I don't know if anyone has got a question to that, uh, a response to that. Um, it seems to me that they could indeed play a role, but there's a whole variety of um, sort of um, media um, potential uh, agents out there who can help mediate these relationships. Um, uh, Jeff, I can't see um, Jerry's hand or um, David's hand, but I w was wondering if it was possible to give them the mic briefly. Okay, well, I'm not getting a response to that, and I'm also aware that we are um, officially out of time. We were meant to uh, finish uh, on the hour. Um, let me just ask if any of the panelists would like to make any final closing contributions, things that have occurred to them uh, since, they, uh, since they had their original presentation. Kwasi, I can see that you've just opened your mic. Did you want to say something? Um, yes, uh, some few things. Uh, one on the data, um, I support uh, the point you made about encouraging collaboration between the researchers and the practitioners, um, because most often what you see is that you have the planners at the Ministry of Health uh, developing their plans, and they hardly uh, have any contacts uh, with uh, researchers either at the university or, or at other levels and uh, in research. I think what is also alarming, uh, if you take the situation in Ghana, is that um, I don't know where that trend comes from, but in, in, in most cases, patients are given their uh, dossier, they are given their map, uh, folders with information to take home. So under such circumstances, it's very difficult uh, for, the, for the smaller clinics, but even at the, the teaching hospitals, to keep information uh, on patients, and I think those information uh, with, with respect to diagnosis, utilization, uh, are very crucial for developing effective uh, uh, programs. What I think is also important is donors uh, also make conscious effort to support, on one hand, gathering uh, information on programs, performance of programs, but also um, supporting evaluation. And what we've seen, whether you talk about Paris Declaration or, or all those um, uh, policies, there is complete lack uh, of uh, efforts on supporting uh, data gathering. Um, and I think in our work, uh, we've, uh, we've done uh, quite uh, a lot in, in stimulating uh, data gathering uh, on programs, but also uh, on the effectiveness uh, of the programs that we do. Thank you very much, um, Kwasi. Uh, Guy, I wondered if you wanted to contribute. Yes, thank you. I think um, somebody raised the important point about uh, the, the risks involved in, in when in particular players become excessively powerful in markets. And I think market, we understand quite well that uh, monopolies can, can um, can be incompatible with really healthy markets and that healthy markets tend to be associated with an appropriate degree of competition. I think it's worth in this uh, context thinking about both public as well as private uh, monopolies and the importance of uh, competition all around um, in, in developing a healthy, a healthy functioning market.
Thank you, Guy. Uh, I think the point was well taken, and, and I felt quite stumped by some of those questions about you know, how do we prevent some powerful players from really dominating the market. But I think it, in addition to the points you've made, it, it also links back to this idea about um, uh, strategic leadership being able to track what's going on in markets and having the capacity to, to respond um, to them. Um, there was just another question coming in on um, Twitter that I just wanted to uh, ask about. Given uh, coming from uh, Rob Yates, given Guy's comments regarding financing, why are donors subsidizing private voluntary health insurance in Africa? I don't know, Guy, whether you would be willing to uh, respond to that question. I'd be happy to. Um, uh, uh, well, I think I think that the, um, there can be a, a difference of opinions on the role of private voluntary health insurance. I know from the gate in the Gates Foundation, we there's a consensus that's probably shared with by many others that uh, this is not a route that's going to go to significant scale as a basis for universal coverage for reasons that are reasonably well known. Um, but others, of course, are free to disagree with that opinion. Uh, I also think that it doesn't mean to say that um, governments might choose to, they might choose to engage with private insurance companies um, and, and third party administrators in, uh, in rolling out uh, uh, social or mandatory health insurance. Uh, there is an open, I think there's a valid question about whether private health, private voluntary health insurance helps to develop some of the capacities that will be necessary for um, broader social health insurance, such as the ability to, um, to, to manage claims and uh, analyze costs, uh, and accredit uh, providers, and so on. I think there might well be some merit to that notion that uh, these are quite complex tasks and uh, anything that helps develop those capacities in countries could be a building block for the future. Um, but I think that's an empirical question and people could differ in their opinions on it. Yeah. Thank you, Guy. And, and I do think it's, it's difficult. I mean, obviously the group that met at Bellagio was a diverse group, I think probably with quite different positions on some of the, these questions. So the Bellagio report, I think, reflected the things that we were in agreement about, um, and as Guy suggested, there may be differing views around some of uh, these issues. Um, I'm aware that we're sort of six minutes past the hour, I, um, and I think that we should probably move to um, close this discussion. I just wanted to acknowledge a, a question that's just come in from Sheikh Wakas Hamid, um, which is talking about um, the situation in developing countries such as Pakistan, where many uh, public sector health workers um, also work in the private sector in order to supplement their income and the potential inequities that would be created if, um, the, if the public sector was also going to sort of subsidize what was going on in the private sector. So again, this is coming back to this question about what is the appropriate role for government, government finance and what are the equity implications of uh, subsidizing uh, private, uh, private sector actors. I don't think that we're going to have time to resolve um, these really important issues, um, but I would like to close instead by thanking all the panelists for their um, thought-provoking comments, which have really left us with uh, a lot of food for thought um, going forward. I think that um, there are some very important questions that we're going to continue to need to discuss about the role of health markets how we can strengthen regulatory environments in a way that um, don't uh, create uh, unnecessary obstacles to private sector um, participation in the health market, but really do ensure appropriate quality um, access issues across both public and private sectors. How do we understand the evolving business models and how can we track them um, and, and what are their implications in terms of the long term Term dynamics of health markets. I think there's a real concern about how what we do now affects the evolution of health markets and where we are in 15 or 20 years from now, and recognizing the path dependency in health markets. I, mean, I feel that one of the sort of strongest messages that actually it's been really nice to see echoed by many of the panelists today has been about the need for joint learning approaches, 
So the need for different actors to come together from um, the public sector, the private sector, from academia, to engage in um, sort of targeted research and learning about these rapidly evolving and very dynamic health markets so that we can better guide our policy and practice in this field. And I think that that's um, a really important agenda uh, for the future. So um, we're going to sign off now. My apologies for letting this run 10 minutes uh, late, but thank you very much indeed for your active participation, and I have really appreciated the comments coming uh, from the, the panelists. I believe that there will be another um, uh, as webinar such as this on uh, the private sector in health, and we will make sure that we can inform you all in advance of that, that next seminar. So thank you very much indeed, and goodbye. <laughs>